I'd like to read you the prayer of the Magnificat in honor of our Blessed Mother, who is our topic for this evening. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on his lowly servant. From this day, all generations will call me blessed. The Almighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. He has mercy on those who fear him in every generation. He has shown the strength of his arm. He has scattered the proud in their conceit. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones and has lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has come to the help of his servant Israel, for he has remembered his promise of mercy, the promise he made to our fathers, to Abraham and his children forever. And together, glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. The Canticle of Mary, or the Magnificat, is in the back of a uh, monthly prayer guide called the Magnificat. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's a nice uh, spiritual companion uh, on a daily basis throughout the year. Uh, And so... Uh, It's something you might want to check out if there's a web version as well as a hard copy. I, of course, get the large, big letter edition so that I can read it uh, to you. This is the last class, and in many ways it is the, what's been the framework behind the scenes of our entire discussions on the theology of grace, namely Mary who brings Jesus to all, to all humanity, and is a pivotal figure in salvation history. And so it's appropriate that we, we end our program uh, examining Mary's role uh, in the order of grace. Now, Mary is a controversial figure when we think outside of the Catholic Church and other Protestant faiths. Uh, often there are misunderstandings uh, that creep into what people perceive Mary is and her role. She's obviously a tremendous blessing uh, to the church and to our faith uh, and has inspired many of Christians throughout the centuries to heroic acts of virtue and charity. But there's also a misunderstanding for non-Catholics when we start to talk about Mary, and it's good to get them out of the way right at the beginning. The first one is that any discussion of Mary and her role uh, in the order of grace immediately for some Protestants means that we're compromising Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ is our one mediator before God, so any Mary talk will distract and dilute that. So that's one misperception that Protestants have about Mary. Another one is uh, the constant refrain of where is that in the New Testament? Where is that in the Old Testament? All these Marian dogmas about the Immaculate Conception or the Assumption. What scripture passage justifies that belief, uh, you Catholics? And the Marian dogmas and our whole understanding of Mary in particular are, are grading to Protestants because they're a wonderful example of the development of dogma, the development of faith. Namely, that our Catholic faith is not some static thing, but our appreciation and understanding of the faith deepens as time goes on. So we're not stuck in a particular uh, frame of mind with a book. Uh, And in fact, that book, as we've talked about before, is a product of that living tradition of the Catholic Church. So, so too, Mary uh, and our theology of Mary, sometimes referred to as Mariology, is the fruit of the church's reflection on what occurred in the Old and New Testaments and in the life and deeds of Jesus Christ and those who followed him. So, I'm going to turn this on its head. Mary is actually, uh, not only clarifies our faith, and who Jesus is and what Jesus did for us, but she properly understood can also be a source of Christian unity. 
And I hope to show tonight those three things, uh, that she can be a source of Christian unity properly understood, that she plays a pivotal role in the theology of grace and in grace in our lives, and that in doing that, she clarifies who Jesus is and what he does for us. So that's uh, the program for tonight. Uh, I would mention that we need to avoid two what I'll call unhelpful positions, and I should draw attention to this. Mary and Mariology is not what I call Christology light or Jesus Christ light. There's a, a tendency sometimes in the history of the church and its devotion to isolate Mary from the deeds and actions of Jesus Christ. Uh, some piety in certain uh, parts of the world have a isolating tendency in them that Mary uh, is the show. And this has a tendency to reinforce in Protestants, see, you worship a woman. You're not worshiping God or Jesus Christ. So that's one unhelpful uh, position we need to avoid, namely a disconnected Mariology. It has to be informed and connected to her divine maternity, as we will see. The other uh, position to avoid is extreme ignorance about the role of Mary and the entire theology of the woman, which I'll elaborate just the framework of for tonight that we find in the Old and New Testament and in the life of the church. It's often ignored. Uh, it's not clear to me why it's ignored, but it's often ignored even in theological journals about this role of the woman in the Old and New Testament, how that was very different than how women were treated in polyistic faiths or pagan beliefs, what was the role of women. Uh, and what you'll see is that Christianity, Judaism and Christianity, actually elevated the role of women in comparison to how pagan faiths and cultures treated women as well. And we'll take a brief look at that. So those are the two positions to avoid. Uh, of this isolating Mary from Jesus and from being ignorant of Mary's preeminent role, as I put here, through her yes to the angel of fiat, let it be done to me according to thy will, and the incarnation began at that moment. So the way we'll organize this evening is I'll spend some time of Mariology in the Bible as anticipated in the Old Testament, uh, and the theology of woman that emerges from that, as well as uh, how the New Testament writers and early Christians thought and believed about Mary. I'll spend some time on Marian belief in the church and what it means and its significance, particularly that it clarifies who Jesus was and is. So Mariology, in many ways, is a guarantor of authentic Christology, as we'll see. We'll spend some time on Mary's divine maternity and virginity, as well as the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, we, we simply don't have time tonight to get to the dogma of the Assumption. Uh, I like to think of it as a, a wondrous uh, culmination, as I put it here, of what the angel Gabriel announced to Mary. Uh, that God was asking her to be the mother of God, and she said yes. And think of it as almost a universal canonization of Mary's life and her yes that is celebrated and elevated to the level of a dogma of the faith. So let's begin with the Old Testament. And, and the headlines from the Old Testament that I'll develop somewhat, although we could obviously spend a lot of time on this, is really as follows, that Marian piety and theology is a natural extension of what occurs in the Old Testament, particularly this theology of woman that I refer to. The first headline from the Old Testament, which is, is there and present, is when the people of Israel eventually form a covenant with God, Yahweh, as he's referred to in the Old Testament, particularly coming out of Egypt. That covenant relationship between the people of Israel and Yahweh 
is always framed and described as a marriage relationship, nuptials. Israel is the spouse, God is the bridegroom. And what plays out over time is the infidelity of Israel to the covenant and God punishing Israel. He sends different kingdoms to crush them. Eventually, uh, the kingdoms separate, if you recall, somewhere around uh, 800 B.C. Uh, the kingdoms separate into the ten northern kingdoms and the two southern kingdoms of Judah in the Old Testament. You have the prophets coming and telling the kings of Israel and Judah, uh, be faithful to the covenant or you will be overrun and destroyed. Eventually, the northern kingdoms fall to Assyria in 722 B.C., and Judah falls in 586 B.C. These are landmark, epical moments in the history of Israel and in the history of the Old Testament. That constant fidelity, infidelity that the prophets talk about, about Israel, is characterized as a nuptial marriage relationship. And we'll spend a little time on that as examples. The prophets are constantly talking about the uniqueness of God in distinction to the polytheism of the Assyrians and the Babylonians that surround Israel in those days and in those times. They're constantly asking them, conjoling them, demanding that they stop sacrificing to idols. If you've read the Old Testament, you're familiar with these stories. But it was more than that. Uh, idolatry in the Old Testament, more times than not, didn't just mean incensing to a stone statue. It meant the fornication cults that were based upon the fertility rites of the Babylonian gods. So the polytheism of the Babylonians and other religions of the time that Israel was at war with uh, promoted uh, these fertility, fertility cults that involved ritual fornications in their temples to make sure the crops came in uh, that spring and fall. Uh, this was constant, and Israel constantly was battling, was constantly flirting and being seduced by her neighbors. So covenant theology of the Old Testament between God and Israel recasts that relationship between men and women in marriage, in heterosexual monogamous marriage. You might recall Abram, Abraham had multiple wives. Jacob had at least two wives. It's finally when we get to covenant theology in the 9th, 8th, 7th century B.C. that this relationship is recast as monogamous, heterosexual marriage as a symbol of God's love for Israel, surrounded by polytheistic enemies and neighbors who reduce women to fertility rights uh, in the temple. We, we often forget that that's what was going on in the Old Testament, and out of that is forged this covenant theology, which is nuptials between a man and a woman. I mention this because I always like to make contemporary comparisons. That is the natural state of society left to itself without Christianity, by the way, namely polytheism. So we're not bowing down before images of Baal, who was one of the leading Babylonian gods, uh, but the same kind of decline in marriage, in heterosexual marriage, is emblematic of the agnosticism and atheism of our culture today. It's one of the first things that goes. And so, and in other faiths and religions, it never went away. If you study Hinduism at all, or even Buddhism, uh, the key goddesses uh, and the key goddess of Krishna is the goddess of love, bhakti. Now, bhakti is not in a monogamous married relationship as she sprinkles and expresses love uh, in her romantic adventures. It's not an emblem of monogamous married love between a man and a woman, nor is it meant to be in Hinduism. In fact, there's bhakti yoga, uh, and there's other rituals associated with bhakti today practiced in Hinduism and in Westerners who partake of that. So 
This never goes away, really. It's always underneath the surface in the West, and it's been part of the staples of societies in the East. If you've ever done any work or traveled to Asia, you will see these temples all over Thailand, all over China, uh, and it's like an ATM machine, or it's like... Uh, any like uh, any a uh, Walgreens in our society. So these things are staples in these cultures, and and make no mistake, that's what's going on, uh, and it it never went away. If we turn specifically to develop, again, all I can do is at a high level the theology of woman in the Old Testament. It starts in Genesis. So what makes the Judeo-Christian ethos different than any other religion that's ever appeared on the face of the earth of any significance is the elevation of women. Namely, that God creates male and female, he created them in the image of God. So God cannot be adequately imaged by human beings without the male and female aspects. So that is uh, a significant marker that the writer of Genesis is, is promoting right from the beginning that would conflict with the polytheism of the time. This will receive an interesting uh, development in the second account of creation that we find in the book of Genesis. As I've mentioned to you before, there are actually two accounts of creation in the book of Genesis if you read the first two chapters. When we get to the second account of Genesis, Eve is created from the rib of Adam, if you recall that. Eve comes from what's interior to what it means to be human, whereas Adam came from the dust or the ground or external matter. There's a significance to this that will play out in the Old Testament and the New Testament, namely that the woman will be the bearer of what is the unique gifts that God gives to humanity at the beginning. And the key one is immortality. That's the key gift that was lost when our first parents fell. It's the key thing that separates mere mortals from the gods in Greek mythology, that we all must die. The gods don't die. So already from the beginning... Uh, Eve being created from the rib of Adam is suggestive, is provocative of the trajectory that's going to take place throughout the Old Testament. When we advance to the third chapter of Genesis, verse 20, after the fall, it's significant, and in particular we'll be reading from uh, Pope Benedict XVI's work on Mary, uh, which I quote from here, that two things happen. Eve receives her life-bearing dignity after the fall. Namely, she will bear children. She will bear children in pain, but she will bear children, which suggests the promise of a kind of immortality through a different way, through future generations. And secondly, she receives her name after the fall. Eve the mother of all the living, associated, and that's what that word means in Hebrew, uh, that Eve as woman is associated with this immortality that will continue through the generations. That wasn't promised to Adam. didn't necessarily have to be promised to Eve, but it was. And so we have, after the fall, a promise made to the woman that's not made to the man that she will bear children in pain over the generations. So if I read the quotation from Cardinal Ratzinger at the time, and this work was written in German in the 1970s before he was made uh, head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith by Pope John Paul II, I believe in 1980 or 81 is when that occurred. But it was translated into English in the mid-1980s. So, quote, in my opinion, it is significant that her name is bestowed in Genesis 3.20 after the fall, after God's words of judgment. In this way, the undestroyed dignity and majesty of woman are expressed. She preserves the mystery of life, 
the power opposed to death. For death is like the power of nothingness, the antithesis of Yahweh, who is creator of life and the God of the living. She who offers the fruit which leads to death, whose task manifests a mysterious kinship with death, is nonetheless from now on the keeper of the seal of life and the antithesis of death. She, even post-fall, still bears the, the mark, the residue, the aroma of this immortality by future generations that will flow from all women. The difference between what is and what is not. She guarantees the future of the human race. If we continue through the Old Testament, and I think you can appreciate I have to summarize 45 books in a slide. <laughs> uh, but I just wanted to point out uh, a few things. Of course, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, are the bearers of the message, the content, and the history of Israel. So I, in no way am I... Uh, ignoring that or pretending that is not the case. Uh, and that has a certain perspective and hue to it. Uh, however, uh, there are many examples, and I'll pick three, of interesting what I'll call role reversals among key matriarchs in the Old Testament. And this role reversal is around fertility. You can see how... Uh, how, what's the word I'm looking for, how subversive the Bible's use of fertility is against the pagan cultures of the time it was written against. And that will be one of the themes we develop a bit, and you can see where that's heading when we talk about the virginity of Mary. But you remember the story about Sarah and Hagar. Sarah is the wife of Abraham. She's struggling to have children. So she actually recommends to Abraham, please have relations with Hagar, my slave servant, so that you can have a son. So Abraham does. And the son's name is Ishmael. Now, Sarah resents this because she doesn't have children yet. Now, she eventually will have children. But there is this sense of, Infertility is a curse, fertility is a blessing, and Sarah is the matriarch. God takes compassion on Hagar. She's banished, uh, and out of her isolation comes Ishmael and that entire trajectory in history. But eventually Sarah does carry on the line. Or the story of Jacob and Rachel and Leah. You remember that story. So Jacob happens upon uh, Rachel, who is the daughter, the youngest daughter, of Laban. Laban says, you can marry Rachel, who is beautiful in Jacob's eyes, but you have to work for me for seven years. So he does. They have the wedding ceremony, the party, and then somehow Laban substitutes Leah, the oldest daughter, who's also unmarried, to Jacob. Jacob doesn't know. We, we don't have to ask why, perhaps too much of the, uh, the wine at, at the wedding. He has children with Leah. He then says to Laban, why did you do this to me? And Laban says, fine, you can marry Rachel. I always have to marry the oldest daughter first. That's why I substituted in the night on you. So he eventually marries Rachel, who is childless until finally she has Joseph the next patriarch that carries on the history of Israel. So again, out of the infertility of Rachel comes Joseph. Out of the infertility of the situation, God weaves out uh, the trajectory that leads to Jesus. The last story, which doesn't maybe get enough press, uh, is Hannah. Does anyone know who Hannah is? Hannah is the mother of Samuel. Now, the father of Samuel uh, actually was married to Penina. And Penina would make fun and mock Hannah because she was childless. So uh, 
Ekina is, I, I hope I'm not mispronouncing his name, is the father of Samuel eventually, and he's married to Hannah and Penina. One day, Hannah is in the temple praying silently. Her lips are moving, and the prophet Eli says, Woman, are you drunk again? Why are you, why are you babbling? She says, I'm not babbling. I'm upset. I'm childless. And after that, she then conceives a son, Samuel. So you see in these stories, the infertility of the world is transformed by the fertility of God through these privileged matriarchs. And these stories intimate, as I mentioned, suggest what the role of virginity is going to play when something entirely new is going to happen, where we're not just going to hint at how God uses the infertility of the world to bear fruit. He's going to proclaim it, and it will be embodied in Mary. Let me read just the prayer of Hannah here. Uh, He raises the needy from the dust, from the ash heap lifts up the poor, to seat them with nobles and make a glorious throne their heritage. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. He guards the footsteps of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall perish in the darkness, for not by strength does one prevail. And this is the, the speech or prayer of Hannah as she's dedicating Samuel. So you see the reversal of earthly values uh, and God's values. The first shall be last the last shall be first. What does Hannah's speech remind you of? The Magnificat. There was a method to my madness in starting with that prayer. You see the parallelism that's going on already. And of course, Jesus was referred to as son of David. And who did Samuel anoint but David as king? Okay. So as we develop this further, and please realize I'm skipping over many books of the Old Testament, many characters and themes. The theology of woman reaches its height right at the time when Assyria is about to level the northern kingdoms, uh, and there will be a massive refugee crisis to the southern kingdoms, and it's called the exile. And these prophets are sometimes called exilic prophets, pre-exilic It means they're preaching around the time of the exile of the northern kingdom. And those prophets are typically Amos and Hosea. And again, returning to the theme of God's relationship to Israel as one of marriage, I'll I'll just read to you uh, chapter 2 of Hosea. It's, It's pretty spicy, so get ready. So keep in mind... Hosea is a prophet writing at the time of when, when the people of Israel are worshiping the different gods of Babylon. They're spending a little too much time in the temples uh, called idolatry. And this is what Hosea writes. Accuse your mother, accuse. And this is God speaking through Hosea. For she is not my wife, and I am not her husband. Let her remove her prostitution from her face, her adultery from between her breasts. Or I will strip her naked, leaving her as on the day of her birth. I will make her like the wilderness, make her like an arid land, and let her die of thirst. This is God talking about the people of Israel and the covenant. I will have no pity on her children, for they are children of prostitution. Yes, their mother has prostituted herself. She who conceived them has acted shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers, who give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, my oil and my drink. Therefore, I will hedge in her way with thorns and erect a wall against her, so that she cannot find her paths. If she runs after her lovers, she will not overtake them. If she seeks them, she will not find them. Then she will say, I will go back to my first husband, for I was better off then than now. She did not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the wine, and the oil. I who lavished upon her silver and gold, for which she used for Baal. Therefore I will take my grain in its time, and my wine in its season. I will snatch away my wool and my flax, which were to cover her nakedness. 
Now I will lay bare her shame in full view of her lovers, and no one can deliver her out of my hand. Now this goes on. This goes on verse after verse after verse in the second chapter of Hosea. You see what's happening is the prophet is describing the infidelity of this nuptial relationship between God and the people of Israel. Now he'll spend chapter 3 talking about how God will still be faithful even if Israel is unfaithful. He will still attempt to call Israel back. And eventually, Hosea says, she will come back. Maybe not today or tomorrow, but she will come back. And then finally in chapter 11, we see this develop further, I won't read it to you, of God's covenant with Israel. It can't be about the land anymore because they've lost the land. It can't be the land of milk and honey, they've lost that. So what does the covenant amount to? It amounts to God being faithful to Israel even if she is not, even if she is dabbling with these other gods. And that's where things stand, frankly, until the exile gets a stay, so to speak, when the Persians return and give the Jews some religious freedom and liberty to build the temple again and to worship freely. But that won't occur really until the 5th century B.C. Quoting from Cardinal Ratzinger then, Pope Benedict XVI, in talking about this covenant, quote, for this reason the covenant which forms the very basis of the existence of Israel as a nation and the existence of each individual as an Israelite is expressed interpersonally in the fidelity of the marriage covenant and in no other way. There is no other categorization of how God relates to his people other than through this marriage covenant. Marriage is the form of the mutual relationship between husband and wife that results from the covenant, the fundamental human relationship upon which all human history is based. It bears a theology within itself, and in, indeed it is possible and intelligible only theologically. But above all, this also means that to God, the one is joined, not a goddess, but as his historical revelation, the chosen creature, Israel, the daughter Zion, the woman. So when God makes contact with his people, he characterizes that as a covenant married relationship with the expectation of monogamy, fidelity, and heterosexuality. So that is what happens when you have ethical monotheism, in contrast to the religions that surrounded Israel of the time and the religions that surround us today in the West. I would love to spend time on the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. So the books that were influenced by Greek culture, so things like the book of Job or Proverbs or Sirach, where we have the beautiful description of wisdom as the mediator and messenger of God by which all things are known and made and made beautiful. Unfortunately, we, we just don't have time for it. And I just make a subnote here that Sophia in Greek means wisdom. And it's a feminine pronoun, as it is in Hebrew. So, really to summarize, we see in this reading of the Old Testament, through the fall of the northern and southern kingdoms, uh, all the way up to what's the post-exile theology, is that God weaves the history of Israel out of the infertility of the matriarchs and their cry and their lament. We see the values are turned upside down, that the first shall be last and the, fa and the last shall be first, that the poor will be raised to the rich and the rich will be bowed down. We also see, as I've mentioned, that the covenant is expressed in the form of marriage. And this is what will carry us forth uh, as we go to uh, the New Testament. This is what has been... Uh, this is what's poised as the New Testament starts. I mentioned the person of Mary in the New Testament 
is this new conduit, is this blessed hinge, as sometimes the fathers of the church refer to Mary. Why do they call her a hinge? Because she connects what's old with what's new. In a beautiful way, she represents the people of Israel. She represents all of us in that sense. And what goes from here in the New Testament text is as follows. If you recall, John the Baptist is announced to Zechariah in the temple area. Zechariah is a priest of the temple, which would be appropriate for the Jewish people. It's what they would have expected. Obviously, the angel, Gabriel, appeared directly to Mary and asked her if she would give God a human nature, and she said yes. But what's interesting is the follow-up stories we have in Luke where Mary goes to visit Elizabeth, and Elizabeth recognizes that Mary is the mother of our Lord and that John in her womb leaps for joy. And the same verb that was used there was used when David was dancing for joy in the temple area in the Old Testament. Uh, But something new and different is happening. The fact that this would be announced between two women about this inbreaking of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the writer of Luke is trying to say something new and different is occurring here that wasn't expected exactly this way. Mary's yes, though she is a virgin and conceives Jesus, recalls this infertility, fertility dynamic of the Old Testament. She is the people of Israel. She is true Zion. And she bears the the mark of all of the matriarchs of Israel that preceded her. And in her yes, she achieves this perfect union of God working and bearing fruit through the infertility of the world. Another story in the Gospel of John is the wedding feast of Cana. It's the first public miracle of Jesus in John's Gospel. And as you recall that story, at the wedding feast they've run out of the good stuff. (laughs) And Mary recognizes that they have no more wine. And what does Jesus say to her? He says, what is that to you and to me? What is that to us? Now, there's only two times in the New Testament when Jesus refers to himself and another creature in the plural, we, us. There's only two times that ever, ever happens. One time was with Peter to pay the temple tax, go to the the lake, find the fish with the coin, and pull it out so that we may not give scandal and pay the temple tax. The only other time in sacred scripture that Jesus refers to himself and another creature is when he says to Mary, his mother, what is that to us that they have no wine? Mary launches Jesus on his public career, on his ministry. What is her response, as mothers will do with their sons? She ignores him (laughs) and says to the steward, do whatever he tells you. And then we have the beautiful miracle of the old and the new. The new wine Jesus uh, creates on the spot. At the end of John's Gospel, we have Jesus' words from the cross. Woman, behold your son. You are now the bearer of the church that I am continuing and inaugurating with my death and resurrection. And what does he say to the disciple? Behold your mother. So the apostles with Mary will continue the church in its definitive and authentic expression at the foot of the cross. So in continuing and reading from Pope Benedict XVI, he pivots from all of this history in the New Testament, and he's emphasizing the values reversal that occurs with Jesus Christ, that the entire 
way of thinking about how God will come to save us that Israel thought would be political liberation is actually spiritual liberation. And liberation from what? Liberation from sin. That is the true liberation, true freedom in Jesus Christ. And so in commenting on this, Pope Benedict XVI, I quote, in essence, the Beatitudes of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, only offer variations of the Magnificat spiritual center. He ejects the mighty from their throne. He elevates the humble. The center of the Magnificat contains simultaneously the center of the biblical theology of the people of God. This insight illuminates the distinctive structures of the Marian dogmas. For if such is the case, they cannot be deduced from the individual texts of the New Testament. Instead, they should they express the broad perspective embracing the unity of both testaments. Now, there's several things there at work. Isn't it interesting that Pope Benedict sees in the Magnificat, which precedes the Sermon on the Mount, obviously, the entire center of biblical theology, both in old and new, in this entire values reversal of what the gospel message brings. And the other interesting comment, which we all maybe sometimes have had a tendency to fall into, is when we attempt to defend the Marian doctrines to non-believers or to Protestants, where is that in the New Testament that Mary was immaculately conceived? Where is the dogma of the assumption in the New Testament? You won't find it there. And what Pope Benedict is saying is it's deeper than that. It's what holds the old and new together is the person of Mary. And to think that there would be texts about that when she surrounds and imbues and suffuses all of the texts of sacred scripture, starting with the theology of woman in the Old Testament and re reaching its crescendo with her yes to the angel Gabriel, that that's where we find this faith that the church will develop uh, over time. Now, this form of biblical interpretation is called uh, typology. It's a fancy word meaning there are parallels. So, for example, St. Paul uses this kind of way of describing Jesus as the new Adam. There's a parallel to Adam in the Old Testament. Or... There are other examples. You remember Moses lifting up the serpent on the pole, and if people would look at the serpent lifted up, they could be healed from the affliction. It recalls and points to Jesus being lifted up on the cross. So this parallelism between old and new, it's called typology, uh, is constant in the fathers of the church and in theologians reflecting on sacred scripture. The lamb, the Passover lamb of the Old Testament. What's the parallel in the new? The lamb of God, Jesus, who's sometimes portrayed as a lamb who was slaughtered on behalf of the people. Let his blood be upon us. This is classic uh, spiritual, biblical reflection that all the saints did, all the fathers of the church did. And the, the biggest emblem of this is Mary. And so these parallels reach their culminating point in the person of Mary. And that is what the Pope is getting at when he says, if you're looking at this granularly, looking for a verse, looking for a text, you're missing the whole point of what's going on between the transition from what's old to what is new. Let's move now to the fundamental foundational dogma in regard to our Blessed Mother, namely Mary as Virgin and Mother of God. This will be an example of how Mariology clarifies what we believe about Jesus Christ. So there was a controversy. You might recall this from past years when we went through this. Who is Jesus? Is he God? Is he man? Is he kind of God, not really, and a man? Is he true God and not really a man? Just play acting? Didn't really suffer, was never really hungry. He was just kind of play acting. Uh, 
So there were heresies in the first five centuries, and they continue now in certain academic departments and universities. But um, the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD was combating a heresy called Nestorianism, which would not affirm that Mary was the mother of Jesus, God, and man. She was merely the mother of Jesus' humanity. That was a her- heresy, and it is a heresy. <clears throat> and so St. Cyril and others in the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD affirmed the full humanity and divinity of Jesus and affirmed Mary's mother of God status. They used a Greek word called mother of God and affirmed that as a dogma of our faith. And in quoting from uh, Pope Benedict, quote, thus the Christological affirmation of God's incarnation in Christ becomes necessarily a Marian affirmation, as de facto it was from the beginning. Conversely, only when it touches Mary and becomes Mariology is Christology itself as radical as the faith of the church requires. See, it was very distasteful for some of the heretics to say that Mary was the mother of God. And and it's a striking affirmation that God who created the universe, who is infinite and eternal, has a mother? Doesn't that somehow compromise him? Or... Rather, does it reveal the full breadth and depth of the Incarnation? The appearance of a truly Marian awareness serves as the touchstone indicating whether or not the Christological substance is fully present. Nestorianism, which is that heresy I was telling you about, involves a fabrication of a Christology form which the Nativity and the Mother are removed a Christology without Mariological consequences. Precisely this operation, which surgically removes God so far from man that nativity and maternity, all of corporeality, remain in a different sphere, indicated unambiguously to Christian consciousness that the discussion no longer concerned incarnation becoming flesh. The center of Christ's mystery was endangered, if not already destroyed. Thus, in Mariology, Christology was defended. Far from belittling Christology, it signifies the comprehensive triumph of a confession of faith in Christ, which has achieved authenticity. So the full-throated affirmation of Jesus being God and man is safeguarded, guaranteed, extended, developed by affirming Mary as the mother of God the mother of his humanity, and bearing that human nature, the mother by extension of his divinity. To suggest that that's not possible or inappropriate is not to affirm the reality of the incarnation, God becoming man. In fact, again, my opinion only the body of Christ, where did we had a class briefly on DNA? Where did his DNA come from? Mary. Where, where else would it have come from? So, in a mysterious way, not only does Mary bring Jesus to us, she brings the Eucharist to us. She's the first tabernacle. So, continuing. We pivot to Mary's virginity. Most Protestants affirm, mainline Protestantism affirms Mary's virginity. What they may not affirm is Mary's perpetual virginity. And in the supplement to the email that you all hopefully received, uh, I didn't want to go through it tonight because it's lengthy, but I cite from a a, a beautiful website uh, six or seven citations from early fathers of the church, St. Ambrose, St. Jerome, uh, Irenaeus, and others, affirming the perpetual virginity of Mary. Often Protestants will say, well, that's something you Catholics, again, made up uh, in the 12th, 13th, 14th century as 
the recitation of the rosary started to, to gain steam and St. Dominic and all of that emerged then. And it's just simply false. Protestants who say that are simply ignorant of religious history. But if we just quote uh, from Justin Martyr, who died uh, and a martyr, as his name implies, in Rome in 165 AD, quote, and this was his dialogue with Trifo, quote, and they became man by the virgin in order that the disobedience which proceeded from the serpent might receive its destruction in the same manner in which it derived its origin. For Eve was a virgin and undefiled, having conceived the word of the serpent, brought forth disobedience and death. But the Virgin Mary received faith and joy when the angel Gabriel announced good tidings to her that the Spirit of the Lord would come upon her and the power of the highest would overshadow her. Wherefore, also the holy thing begotten of her is the Son of God. And she replied, Be it unto me according to your word. Be it done to me according to your word. You see, this is another example of the parallelism. Just as Eve sowed disobedience, Mary in the new sows obedience. It's a very powerful way of understanding sacred scripture. Or from another text from Justin Martyr, his first apology. And here again how Isaiah in express words foretold that he should be born of a virgin. For he spoke thus, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and they shall say for his name, God with us, Emmanuel. For things which were incredible and seemed impossible with men, these God predicted by the spirit of prophecy is about to come to pass, in order that when they came to pass, there might be no unbelief but faith because of their prediction. But lest some, not understanding the prophecy now cited, should charge us with the very things we have been laying to the charge of poets who say that Jupiter went into women through lust, let us try to explain the words. This then. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, signifies that a virgin should conceive without intercourse. For if she had intercourse with anyone whatever, she was no longer a virgin. But the power of God, having come upon the virgin, overshadowed her and caused her, while yet a virgin, to conceive. So in the mid-second century, Justin Martyr is hammering home the point in opposition to pagan Rome. Well, that we've got examples of Jupiter impregnating women and were they not virgins you see what justin is he's taking on the pagans of his time saying how mary was and is truly a virgin when she bore jesus if we continue irenaeus the bishop of Lyon, mid second century as well toward the beginning of the third century in his book Against Heresies, quote, another example of parallelism. For as by one man's disobedience sin entered and death obtained a place through sin, so also by the obedience of one man, righteousness, having been introduced, shall cause life to fructify in those persons who in times past were dead. As we see in Romans 5.19, and as the protoplast himself, Adam, had his substance from untilled and as yet virgin soil, for God had not yet set rain, and man had not tilled the ground, and was formed by the hand of God, that is, by the word of God, for all things were made by him, as we see in John 1, 3, and the Lord took dust from the earth and formed man, so did he who is the word, recapitulating Adam in himself, so Jesus as the second Adam, rightly receive a birth, enabling him to gather up Adam from Mary, who was as yet a virgin, If then the first Adam had a man for his father and was born of human seed, it were reasonable to say that the second Adam was begotten of Joseph. Joseph. But if the former was taken from the dust and God was his maker, it was incumbent that the latter, Jesus, making a recapitulation in himself, should be formed as man by God, having an analogy with the former as respects his origin. So God made Adam without uh, any... uh, male counterpart, so too God will make Jesus without any male counterpart. It was there that might not another formation called into being, nor any other which should be saved, but that the very same formation should be summed up in Christ, the analogy having been preserved. See, Irenaeus is trying to preserve the perfect harmony and analogy, this parallelism I keep talking about, 
of what occurred in the Old Testament and what occurred in the New Testament through Mary. In your handout that was emailed to you, we have the proto-gospel of James. It didn't make it into the New Testament. There were reasons for that. It's still an interesting historical document. It was written, people think, around 120 A.D. It precisely affirms the perpetual virginity of Mary. St. Jerome, in commenting on this, on Matthew and on Luke, affirms the perpetual virginity of Mary himself, and he cites Polycarp. Polycarp was the bishop of Smyrna after John, the gospel writer, the disciple of Jesus. So you see the beauty of being Catholic is we can point to all of these historical witnesses that have nothing to do with what was written down because what's part of the sacred tradition of the church is older, broader, ampler, wider than what's written in the New Testament. And when you have clever preachers talk about the brothers of Jesus and they, they want to be slick and cool, they're actually ignorant of this history and interpretation that Jerome thought those brothers of Jesus were either the sons of Joseph from a first marriage or the cousins of Jesus. And the Greek and Hebrew words that are used support those interpretations. So don't be fooled by, by faux uh, preaching. Continuing, so the church is reflecting all the, on all of this as she travels through time in the 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 5th century and moving forward and eventually coalesces in part in the New Testament, the 27 books we have in the New Testament, the four Gospels that are eventually selected. Let me read this passage from Pope Benedict because he's now associating Mary's virginity and motherhood with this theology of woman that we have been talking about. Being unwed and infertile was previously the curse of those abandoned, without a future and therefore without a present. Now, as virginity, the state can forever validly represent the mystery of renunciation and fruitfulness, and together with marriage, to which it refers, express the special characteristic of the God who in creation and redemption seeks out and blesses man. God takes the little things, the powerless things of the world, and achieves greatness. He comes to a woman, perhaps a teenage girl, in a half-pagan town and announces to her, God has come, will you give me a human nature? You, you see how the values of what the world expected is completely turned on its head. So this is the foundational truth about Mary, her divine maternity and her virginity. It is the core affirmation that the early church was quite certain of and affirmed it in all of the texts and writings that I referred to that are in your supplement, receives that dogmatic expression in the Council of Ephesus in 431 AD. It's the basis for the dogmas. And if you try to think about the dogmas of the Immaculate Conception or the Assumption separate from, apart from, Mary's divine maternity, mother of God, and her virginity, they don't achieve their proper context. So that's why I start with this, because any talk of Marian apparitions or the dogmas or anything else regarding Mary, not in the context of her divine maternity uh, and virginity, tethered to Jesus Christ, you're, you're you're not properly situating your Marian piety and devotion. It has to be directly linked to her status as mother of God, mother of Jesus Christ. So continuing now to the Immaculate Conception. This was a dogma defined by Pope Pius IX, Pio Nono, uh, in 1854. It was actually something the Council of Trent considered defining in the 16th century, but did not uh, because of the influence of Thomas Aquinas, who was skeptical about this dogma. Uh, Let me read to you the the key passage from the the bull, uh, Ineffable God. 
quote, by the authority of Jesus Christ our Lord, of the blessed apostles Peter and Paul, and by our own, we declare, pronounce, and define that the doctrine which holds that the Blessed Virgin Mary, in the first instance of her conception, by a singular grace and privilege granted by Almighty God, in view of the merits of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the human race, was preserved free from all stain of original sin, is a doctrine revealed by God, and therefore to be believed firmly and constantly by all the faithful. So this is very clear language, and uh, it is characteristic of when uh, the popes or a general council are about to declare something as a defined dogma of our faith. So there's no ambiguity about what is being affirmed here. Now, this is troubling to non-Catholics, to Protestants. Why? If you recall from classes one and two, we have a fundamentally different understanding of what grace is than what Protestants do, particularly Lutherans, as we looked at them. They view grace as something that comes to a sinner and justifies them externally, forensically. That's not how Catholics view grace. We view grace as grace is the life of God that makes real contact with humanity and transforms us really and truly into something wonderful and beautiful. Grace is not snow on a dung heap, as Luther thought. That humanity remains this reeking pile of corruption, and God snows his grace and covers it, but there's no internal rejuvenation of the human person. There's no internal renewal. It's just you are declared justified. You are saved. That's not the original understanding of grace. The original understanding of grace is that God comes to meet us really and truly, and he first did that in the Incarnation. He does it in the Eucharist. But he truly in our lives meets us really and truly and wants to transform us in our nature. I said earlier that you see the role of Mary as this blessed hinge, this figure that unites the Old and New Testament through her yes, her perfect response to God's initiative. She's the first disciple. You've perhaps heard that expression before. She stands as the first member of the church, and in a mysterious way, she is the church. And we refer to the church as our mother. But Mary, in her yes and in her life with Jesus and launching him on his public ministry, in a beautiful way, in a symbolic way, represents the church and is the church in its perfection. It's one of the reasons why Vatican II, in their dogmatic statement on the church, includes a chapter on Mary. There was a question among the bishops, should we have a separate statement on Mary? And they said, no. Mary's not something off to the side. She is constitutive of the church. She's not a side feature. Continuing this development on the Immaculate Conception, in reading from Paul, fifth chapter, letter to the Ephesians, verses 25 to 27, this is what follows after Paul says, wives be submissive to your husbands. <laughs> what happened to the theology of woman? <laughs> but quote, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and handed himself over for her. He died for the church. For her to sanctify her, cleansing her by the bath of water with the word that he might present to himself the church in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. So we see the full trajectory of Yahweh related to the people of Israel as a nuptial relationship. Israel is the spouse of God. And the church continues this imagery. The church is the bride of Christ. For those of you who are married, on your wedding day, the priest said that your marriage is actually a, an example of the true marriage in heaven between Christ and the church. 
Christ died for his spouse. He is faithful to his spouse and fruitful, the possibility of fruitfulness. These are what couples are assenting to on their wedding day. Why are they assenting to those things instead of maybe vows they write themselves in Sanskrit on a beach? It's because marriage, first, is based upon the covenant theology of the Old Testament and reaches its perfection in the new between Christ's love for his spouse, the church. Monogamy in marriage is not a natural result of society. It is a uniquely Judeo-Christian contribution. And to the extent that the Judeo-Christian ethos declines, then we have the whirlwind of what's occurring in marriage today. So married couples are assenting to those goods of marriage, fidelity, permanence, and openness to the possibility of children because that's what Christ has already established through his love of the church. And, as Paul says, his spouse, the church, is presented to him without blemish due to his merits, due to his life, death, and resurrection. You see how then the church, over time, will assign this immaculate status that the church already has achieved through the death and resurrection of Jesus to Mary, who is the church symbolically and is the first member of of the church. So in quotes here, here the doctrine of the Immaculata, like the whole of later Mariology, is first anticipated in ecclesiology, which means study of the church. The image of the church, virgin and mother, is secondarily transferred to Mary, not vice versa. So if the dogma of the Immaculate Conception transferred to the concrete figure of Mary those assertions, then this means that Mary is presented as the beginning and the personal concreteness of the church. It entails the conviction that the rebirth of the old Israel into the new Israel, of which the epistle to the Ephesians spoke, achieves in Mary its concrete completion. It proclaims that this new Israel is not only an idea, but a person. Mary has already and actually achieved the full walk of the spiritual that Jesus inaugurated. And that's ultimately what the dogma of the assumption, which we won't spend time on tonight, signifies, is that in Mary, the church is holy, at least in one person. It achieved its perfection in her perfect yes to the angel Gabriel. And that can be extended to us as well. Continuing this quotation from Pope Benedict XVI, to repeat, Mary the holy remnant, which is an expression that also refers to the people of Israel in the Old Testament. Mary signifies that God's word really brings forth fruit, that God is not the only actor in history, as if history was only his monologue, but finds a response that is truly a response. This is in distinction from Protestant understandings of grace, that we're passive, that we're just covered over. God actually does intervene really and truly. Continuing, as the holy remnant, Mary signifies that in herself old and new covenants are really one. She is entirely a Jewess, a child of Israel, of the old covenant, and as such a child of the full covenant, entirely Christian, mother of the word. She is the new covenant in the old covenant. She is the new covenant as the old covenant, as Israel. Thus, no one can comprehend her mission or her person if the unity of the Old and New Testaments collapses. Because she is entirely response, that perfect yes we're talking about, correspondence, she cannot be understood where grace seems to be opposition and response. That's that Protestant theology coming in again, that grace does violence to us almost. It overwhelms us. We're not free within grace, according to most Protestant theologies. We're passive participants. You recall I affirm that Catholic theology affirms we are free under grace. We're not robots. Okay. Because she is entirely response correspondence, she cannot be understood where grace seems to be opposition and response. 
the real response of the creature appears to be a denial of grace. For example, Luther, for a word that never arrived, a grace that remains solely at God's disposal without becoming a response to him would be no grace at all, but just a futile game. We now are clearing away and seeing what really the doctrine of original sin means and why Mary was preserved from the stains of original sin. Original sin is about that response taking place. In all of us, it's, un, it's sabotaged. It's encumbered by the effects of original sin. It's defeated by our own concupiscence, by our own pride, by our own sinfulness. In Mary, there is no such conflict. There is the perfect response of a creature to God, her yes to the angel Gabriel. And Pope Benedict describes it as, for all of us, it's the conflict between God who is and we who are not in our sinfulness. Because after all, evil is a lack of goodness. In Mary, there is no deviation. Her response is a true, free, and perfect response to God. There is no conflict. This conflict does not exist in Mary, thus the dogma of the Immaculate Conception, her perfect response. So, quote from Benedict, This correspondence of God's yes with Mary's being as yes, note her being is yes, is the freedom from original sin. Preservation from original sin, therefore, signifies no exceptional proficiency, no exceptional achievement. On the contrary, it signifies that Mary reserves no area of being, life, and will for herself as a private possession. Instead, precisely in the total dispossession of self, in giving herself to God, she comes to the true possession of self. The mystery of the barren mother, the mystery of virginity, becomes intelligible once more. Dispossession as belonging as the locus of new life. Thus, the doctrine of the Immaculata reflects ultimately faith's certitude that there really is a holy church as a person and in a person. In this sense, it expresses the certitude of salvation. Included therein is the knowledge that God's covenant in Israel did not fail, but produced a shoot out of which emerged the blossom, the Savior. The doctrine of the Immaculata testifies accordingly that God's grace was powerful enough to awaken a response, that grace and freedom, grace and being oneself, renunciation and fulfillment are only apparent contradictories. In reality, one conditions the other and grants it its very existence. A lot there. Isn't that a beautiful expression of Mary's Immaculate Conception? That she, in a beautiful and perfect way, due to the merits of Jesus Christ, responds perfectly and beautifully to the angel Gabriel and throughout the, her life. So much so that she is a symbol of the church. She's a symbol of what was hoped for in the Old Testament that is finally and truly achieved in the new. And she is the first disciple. And she launches Jesus on his public ministry, as we recall from the wedding feast of Cana. So to sum up, what is the significance of all of this? What is the significance of Mariology? In this passage from Luke, what's interesting is when the angel says, the spirit of the Lord will be upon you and overshadow you, that is the same language used in the beginning of Genesis when the spirit of God is hovering over the chaos, the abyss. This life-giving spirit, you see the parallel once again. Genesis starts this way. The New Testament starts this way. New creation, something new and wonderful is happening. It recalls that true Christian renewal, rebirth, rejuvenation is possible and happened with Mary and Jesus. Quote from Pope Benedict, The virgin birth is the necessary origin of him who is the son and who as the son first endows the messianic hope with a permanent significance extending far beyond Israel. It's now for all, for Gentiles. 
in this new birth, which simultaneously included the abandonment of earthly fertility, of self-disposal, and of the autonomous planning of one's own life, Mary, as mother, is truly the bearer of God. She is more than the organ of a fortuitous corporal event. To bear the Son includes the surrender of oneself into barrenness. Now it becomes clear why barrenness is the condition of fruitfulness. In our spiritual lives, we hear this all the time, that you have to let go, let go, let God. If a box is full of pepper, it can't be full of something else. If we're full of ourselves, we cannot be full of God. It's this beautiful Christian law of the loss of self implies and allows for the recovery of our true selves in Jesus, which is in massive distinction between how our culture today thinks you recover your true self by deeper excavation of yourself. You see how that conflicts with a Christian understanding of what, how do I discover my true self? I discover my true self in God. I don't discover it in my digestion or in a yoga pose. So the other significance, God is real. I know this sounds obvious, uh, but God truly acts in human history and he bears fruit. The objections to Mary's divine maternity and virginity, her immaculate conception, assumption into heaven, in many ways, there are, there are obviously legitimate questions people can have, and I'm not talking about that, but obstinate ref- refusal or ridicule conceals this worldview that God really cannot act in human history. This is the lurking atheism, agnosticism that I talk about that characterizes our time both in the church and outside the church. Quoting again from Pope Benedict, the Virgin Mary is not an idyllic nook of devotion, a tiny private chapel of the two evangelists, an optional extra. I'll just pause here and again an editorial But St. Teresa of Lisieux, I will also lean on because she said the same thing. But she said, show me a lay person or a priest who is devoted to Mary, and I'll show you a saint. Show me a priest or a lay person who is devoted to Mary, and I'll show you someone who loves the Eucharist. Show me a priest or a layman who prays the rosary, and I'll show you someone who can tell you how to get to heaven. Those are just not my words. St. Teresa of Lisieux said them as well. Mary is almost this leading indicator, not only of orthodoxy, but of spiritual wellness. And what Pope Benedict here is saying is she's not some, I love the expression, an idyllic nook of devotion. (laughs) That is to ignore the history of the Old Testament, its trajectory into the new, and what was accomplished in the Incarnation. Continuing the quote, The question of God is at stake. Does God act or not? Can he act at all? The affirmation of Jesus' birth from the Virgin Mary intends to affirm these two truths. God really acts, really, not just interpretively. And the earth produces its fruit precisely because God acts. On this are based the hope, the freedom, the assurance, and the responsibility of the Christian. The images we've been talking about tonight, I, I, they help my spiritual life. I hope they help your spiritual life. Uh, it does create a love and devotion to the Eucharist to the extent that we do pay attention to Mary. And she is a guarantor of orthodoxy, of true belief, and frankly makes us effective disciples to others as well. That, that wraps up the, the section on Mary. We, we just have a few minutes left for my last slide, I promise. <laughs> but if you think about the theology of grace and the five classes we've had, which culminated in Mariology and the reflection on Mary and the theology of the woman, what we've been talking about collides, is in conflict with, uh, is adversarial to, 
our culture. Um, some would use the term pastoral accompaniment. That's an interesting expression for someone who's stealing your wallet. Uh, the thief accompanied me while he took my wallet. That's one expression. But I think it's starker than that. I, I think that it, we are actually on a collision course with the culture, not to dramatize that, but that's always been the case, frankly. I, I think the point I would make is that it's never been any other way. Uh, we might point to a period of time in the 1950s with full classrooms in Catholic grade schools. If you go to the seminary, you'll see ordination classes of 50 men in 1948 and say, wow, wasn't the church, church healthy then? Uh, you could ask, why did it unravel so quickly if the church was so healthy then? I think all of that uh, hides this core conflict that has never gone away and perhaps never will go away. The conflict between God who is and who loves us and the forces that want to destroy that in the church and outside the church. Recalling from class, uh, an earlier class, that quotation regarding Bertrand Russell, who was an atheist, and he asked, God didn't give us enough evidence to believe in him. Why do we think he exists? John Paul published a beautiful book in 1994 called The Cro Crossing the Threshold of Hope, which was an interview he gave. Uh, and it was groundbreaking because popes didn't give interviews like that before. And I just wanted to quote two questions and answers that he gave that illustrate this, this theology of grace that I've been talking about. The interviewer asks, if God exists, why is he hiding? Isn't the objection of many people, yesterday as today, quite understandable? Why doesn't he reveal himself more clearly? Why doesn't he give everyone more tangible access and accessible proof of his existence? Why does his mysterious strategy seem to be that of playing hide-and-seek with his creatures? John Paul II responded, Could God go further in his stooping down, in his drawing near to man, thereby expanding the possibilities of our knowing him? In truth, it seems he has gone as far as possible. He could go no further. In a certain sense, God has gone too far. Didn't Christ perhaps become a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles? Precisely because he called God his Father, because he revealed him so openly in himself, he could not but elicit the impression that it was too much. Man was no longer able to tolerate such closeness and thus the protest began. In other words, beware of what you ask for. Jesus said, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood to have any life within you. And he lost probably three-fourths of the crowd, if you recall, from the Gospels. They said, that's ghoulish. That We're not going to do that. That's ridiculous. Or when Paul went to Athens and said, you see that little monument in the ground that says to the unknown God? I want to tell you about that God. He suffered on a cross and rose from the dead. And they said, we'll hear you on that another time. So John Paul is saying God, in, in a sense, in the person of Jesus, went as far as he was going to go, and he went too far out of love. By dying, by having a bloody sweat, by miracles, it, it was too much. And so the protests began. So it's not that God is mysterious. It's that we can't tolerate his closeness. Who of any of us, if we demand where's God, could stand in front of that light and see ourselves truly revealed as we are in ourselves for the first time? Not an easy thing. Be careful what you ask for. And then the last question the interviewer asked May I ask, have you ever once hesitated in your belief in your relationship with Christ, with Jesus Christ and therefore with God? John Paul responds, quote, Your question is infused with both a lively faith and a certain anxiety. I state right from the outset, be not afraid. This is the same exhortation that resounded at the beginning of my ministry in the Sea of St. Peter. Christ addressed this invitation many times to those he met. The angel said to Mary, be not afraid. The same was said to Joseph, be not afraid. Christ said the same to the apostles, to Peter, in various circumstances, and especially after his resurrection. He kept telling them, be not afraid. 
He sensed, in fact, they were afraid. They were not sure if who they saw was the same Christ they had known. They were afraid when he was arrested. They were even more afraid after his resurrection. The words Christ uttered are repeated by the church, and with the church they are repeated by the Pope. I have done so since the first homily I gave in St. Peter's Square. Be not afraid. These are not words said into a void. They are profoundly rooted in the gospel. They are simply the words of Christ himself. Of what should we not be afraid? We should not... We should not fear the truth about ourselves. Do not be afraid of God's mystery. Do not be afraid of his love. And do not be afraid of man's weakness or of his grandeur. Do not be afraid of God who became man. Do not be afraid of God who became man. That is the theology of grace. That is God's search for man. This wraps up our program for the summer. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for coming.